When we talk about home ventilation, I like to point out that there are five factors for ventilation, not just one. So the fifth one is pressure relief. And pressure relief becomes really important for homes as they become more airtight, which is happening whether we like it or not because of energy codes in all 50 states. Also, people might be building airtight accidentally without realizing it because we're using things like spray foam and weather resistant barrier sheathing like zip or force field or it, the list goes on. There's all kinds of new products that are making homes more airtight accidentally. So don't think that you're immune to this conversation if you're not trying. Uh, now, makeup air is required by code if you have uh, an exhaust hood that is 400 CFM or more. That is stupid. And I'm just gonna let that sit there for a minute. Anybody who's watching this who has been following that rule for a while, that rule is, is a dumb rule because it has nothing to do with reality. That's a prescriptive rule that means something different for every home. This home that we built, this is our forever home. For example, the blower door test for this house is 300 CFM. So if I installed a 350 CFM exhaust hood for code, I don't need to have makeup air. But in reality, that's more than a blower door test on this house. So every time I ran this, I would be doing a blower door test. So you need to use the actual tools, the calculators, and I'm linking a video on screen now on how you can use, there's a, a tool from Brone that's an online calculator. You don't have to use Brone products if you don't want to, but it'll help you to calculate when you need makeup air and how much makeup air you need and whether you need to use passive or active makeup air. And that's a difference of several thousand dollars in materials alone, plus uh, the ease of install. When I turn this on, the makeup air system that I have in this house, just like any one that works well, will activate automatically. I have, through several hundred consultations with people across North America and uh, abroad as well, been trying to kind of codify a strategy so that if you could follow these rules, you would come up with a system that essentially is gonna work in worst case scenarios. This is particularly dangerous in places where it gets hot and humid outside uh, because condensation is the thing that we're always worried about. Moisture is uh, something that's gonna damage the home. If it's dry outside, drying out your house is like, yeah, that has side effects too. Like for example, the floor that I'm standing on might start to separate if it gets cold and dry. And you can actually see that in our floors under my feet right now because we don't have a humidifier installed in this house, which I probably will need to uh, in the next couple of winters to actually make this place totally fit within the five factors of ventilation. So the makeup air rules, as I have started to understand them and helped people to design their systems, are three. Number one, don't blow the makeup air on people. This is a very simple one to follow because it's the same rule that we're following when we design uh, HVAC ductwork to deliver heating and cooling to a space. Don't blow air on people. It just makes people uncomfortable. Uh, second rule is don't blow the makeup air on surfaces inside the house. And that again is mostly for that condensation potential because you don't want the air that's coming in that's potentially hot and moist. And even remember if it's 70 degrees outside, but it's raining, there's no temperature differential but the air will be coming in at 100% relative humidity instead of at 50%, which is what I keep the house at. And the third thing is try and keep the circuit as short as possible so that you have the makeup air delivered into the space as close as possible to where it's being exhausted. Now, these rules are not hard and fast. My scientist friends who are physicists who study ventilation have pointed out like, uh, yeah, you could break them though. And it's true, you can. So. With that being said, let me show you what we designed and I'll tell you first off that this uh, exhaust hood up here gets made up through the crawl space. We have that very complicated uh, active makeup air system and it gets delivered here in these vents. So basically I have one, two, three, four, five vents that are each four inches tall and between 10 and 16 inches wide. And that is so that we can slow the air down as much as possible. Because what you don't want to have happen is that the air comes in and you can hear it whistling or going shh as it shoots into the space. Also, if it was shooting into the space, it would come out from under here and shoot all the way into my room so that even if I was standing over there, I would feel it on my little toesies. Now this breaks the first rule. Don't blow air on people. As my beautiful bride is standing here making pancakes in the morning, and of course for pancakes or for anything else that we're cooking in this house, including toast, 
We are using the exhaust hood, therefore makeup air is coming in. We uh, get around that by, first of all, the active makeup air system that we have has a heater built into it, a preheater. That's a six kilowatt or a 10 kilowatt or even a 20 kilowatt if you can get it. Uh, heater, depending on how much air you're gonna be moving. For 400 CFM, a six kilowatt or a 10 kilowatt is fine. And so we can make that air the right temperature so that it doesn't make her feet cold. But in the summertime, when it's raining outside and it's hot, it's gonna be coming in and it's going to be getting on her feet and her feet are at that point, let's say they're the same temperature as the rest of the interior of my home, which is 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity, which is a very, very comfortable temperature. And if you're one of the people who's like, I like my inside to be 68 degrees all the time, or just when I sleep, you're, it's probable that you have never actually experienced what a home that's high performance feels like. Um, and I'm just gonna park that right there. Feel free to fight with me in the comments if you want. Um, so it's gonna come in and let's say it's 90 degrees and 100% relative humidity. The dew point of that kind of air is 90 degrees. So her feet are 75 degrees, so they're going to have condensation forming on them, which is gonna make them feel a little bit sticky. It's gonna feel hot because condensation results in raising the temperature. So it's just like a little uncomfortable. And Grace is shooting this. Grace, would you like yeah. anything to add? No, I mean, you feel it on the ground too. The, the wood feels a little sticky too. And then the, the floor feels sticky is what she's saying. And that, that is the second rule, which we have also broken in this setup. The uh, air comes in and it is brushing against the surface. This is one of the reasons why I have developed these rules is because like from experience, I know what uh, might not work. Now, if you're willing to put up with that, then there are no other side effects to this system. And that is because we have number one, hardwood floor. This is not an engineered product. There's no like composite in this. This is actual flooring that has been coated three times with flooring uh, finishing. And we used a Bona product that was a very, uh, the first two coats were like the medium um, hardness. And then the final coat that our flooring installer put in was the, the one that they use in like shopping malls. High durability. It was a very, very durable. Yes, it's called traffic, I think. And so this stuff is not going to get through the wood and cause the wood to uh, be affected too much. Also, we don't cook all day long like some families might. So think about that too. But also, the underside of my cabinets is all getting that air as a duct plenum, essentially, um, passing through it. So there is, you can imagine, condensation happening on the inside of the underside of the cabinets. And it doesn't affect us in this case because these cabinets were put together entirely with plywood, not with particle board or any other kind of composite uh, material, OSB, things like that. So the underside is honest to God plywood, number one. Number two, it's finished on both sides. So you can see here, this is painted, but also on the backside where it's not painted, they also applied a polyurethane finish to that. So the fact that it's getting wet in there only has an effect in that it is making it wet and then it will dry out again. Also, I don't know if there's any research on this, and if you guys are watching, then you happen to be physicists or know about some data. I think that it makes sense that you would have a lot less condensation when you've got an airstream moving at 100, 200, or 250 feet per minute, which is what this one is moving at. Based on the amount of openings that I've got here, we have it coming in 400 CFM through an eight inch round, which is like hundreds of feet per minute. And then I upsized it and upsized it and then brought it in here and it's something like 180 feet per minute at this velocity here. So I think that the condensation is probably going to be potentially deposited but then picked right back up again, unless it's again at 100% relative humidity. So there's obviously some variability there, but it kind of makes sense to me that there would be less condensation because the air is moving over the surface. I'm just gonna let you guys comment on that if you have anything to add. The third rule though, keep the circuit as short as possible, is, is what this system was mainly designed to optimize. So the fact that we don't actually have any long-term cons or, or uh, costs to the breaking of the first two rules because we're willing to deal with the slight discomfort of the on the floor and also the fact that none of our materials are rotting because of the condensation means that now we can basically turn on that fan and the air that we replace in this, within this room, which is a big room, it's 24 feet wide, 36 feet long, with an average ceiling height of 13 feet. So there's a lot of air in here. 
I bring the air in here, and what I've just done is take the air from here down to here, and taken it and dumped it outside. And that's the only air that I have then replaced. So the idea at that point is every other bit of air that comes in then gets uh, replaced by that outdoor air coming in. If you do not bring it in as close as possible, the other option is to take the makeup air and dump it into your central duct system or into another room. But again, at that point, even in this room, if I was to dump it on the other side of the room, 50 feet away, catty corner, then potentially all of the air between here and there might get replaced as it gets jetted to outside. In your mind, you might be thinking, well, why don't I just put a dehumidifier in line with this thing so that I dehumidify the air when it comes in? Short answer is there is no residential piece of equipment that can dry 400 CFM or 600 or 800 or 1,000 CFM in one pass. The secret to a whole house dehumidifier is that it's gonna be able to dry some air, send it into the house, grab some more air from the house, dry that, send that in the house, and re-dry the air at some point that it's already dried. So it keeps, every time, it's squeezing more and more water out of the air. So that multiple passes is very handy when it comes to dehumidifiers in residential settings. If you wanted to try and go for an industrial or commercial uh, solution, I don't know what that is. Feel free to link in the comments if you do know of one. Um, but that's why you can't dehumidify this air as it's coming in because nothing in the residential market is gonna dry it enough in one pass to really make it worth its while. So that's your being close to it. Now I will say that there are a couple of options that you might see on YouTube. One is building the makeup air here or at the back into the actual build of your custom cabinet. And I think that that potentially is gonna break one of the first two rules because if it's here, then you're standing here cooking and you're gonna get blown on by the makeup air because it's, not, it's gonna come in as a jet and it's not gonna immediately like turn back around. It's gonna shoot down and hopefully sweep up. Now at that point, if you have a gas cooktop, which I've made a video that I'm linking on screen now about why gas cooktops are not as good as electric or uh, induction, the turbulence issue here with having your makeup air come anywhere near the cooktop is gonna be the problem at that point because you're starting to deform the flames, which by the way, downdraft exhaust hoods are also going to deform the flames and that means that the cooking process is really weird. I can't even, you know, people have said, food tastes better when I cook on gas. That can't possibly be true because the gas flame is not touching the food, it's touching the pan and then the pan is touching the food. But uh, if you do care to use gas and then you've got the flames deformed, I can't imagine that works nearly as well as an induction cooktop or an electric cooktop even. And electric cooktops are not that great to cook on. So you wanna try, in my opinion, to avoid bringing this stuff in right around this. Also, the manufacturers of the exhaust hoods um, have said to me, I don't know if it's embedded in all of the, the manual literature on this, but they said, try not to mess with the actual airflow pattern of the hood itself, which means that that right there is about as close as I would get comfortably to bringing it in close while also not messing with the airflow pattern of this giant inverted bathtub that I've put over my cooktop. Now, you could, if you wanted to, try and use the fact that I've already got this giant cabinet built in and bring the makeup air up there. Here's an idea for you. So if we have a 10 foot ceiling at that corner of the, where the wall meets the ceiling, then I'm six feet tall. Average American male isn't gonna be much taller than six feet tall. If I brought the makeup air in at eight feet up, that's not gonna be blowing on people. It's not gonna be blowing on surfaces. So I would actually win with those first two and I would have the benefit of not interfering with the turbulence while also bringing it in as close as possible. So if you have this 10 foot ceiling, then you have the benefit there. If you have a 14 foot ceiling, which some of my clients have started doing, um, first of all, ceiling fans, very important for you at that point because you're gonna have to keep them on all the time to make sure that you don't have a different temperature at the top of your room than at the bottom. But uh, in that case, you have tons of room to introduce this makeup air. You can use things like architectural features. If you've got like a tray ceiling, then you could kind of use that if you have weird kind of you know, um, built down fake beams in the ceiling, you could use those with linear slot fence. But remember just to use the uh, feet per minute velocity to get that down to, in my opinion, below 250 feet per minute, which is what we expect return grills to be at so that you don't hear the air going through them. 
that would be kind of the maximum velocity that I'd want for that. And you might need a considerable amount of net free area. And if you're using something like a linear slot vent, you're talking about something like maybe 700 linear feet or like, you know, 50 feet long of a one inch slot. So that it works in idea, but when you're actually trying to find 50 feet long that you can put one slot, that becomes uh, difficult. Also, if you're gonna plug this makeup air into your central duct system, you need to now consider that you're gonna be blowing, in my house's case, two tons of air, which is 800 or 900 CFM, and suddenly be adding 600 you know, or 800 or 1,000, depending again on how big you need this thing to be, CFM to that. So I might be potentially doubling the need for airflow of my duct system only every now and then. So then I have to have a duct system that's big enough to handle the capacity of the every now and then bursty uh, capacity of this exhaust hood. So all of those things are variables. And of course, as we expand and you are hopefully a subscriber to this channel, if you're not, please do subscribe. But there's all kinds of other things to do with the enclosure, the air tightness, the insulation levels, the, the doors within the house, the amount of pressure differentials between rooms, all that stuff and the air quality that we're trying to deal with, which I'm gonna, uh, about to make another video about right over here, that are going to start to influence the dynamics here. So make sure that you're paying attention to the whole system, which this is just one piece of. But I hope that this helps you to plan your makeup air system. If you have other ideas, please comment them below, or if you have questions about the things that we've been talking about here, I address those personally. Like, subscribe, tune in next time.